Hello and welcome to this podcast episode number seven. This is Nani, I'm Clara, and today we're going to talk about Edwardian garments combined with bobbin lace. We also have a guest, Emeline, on this podcast, which we're really excited about, so stay tuned for that. We're going to start with our finished objects with our category Done and Delighted. So we have worked on a few projects over the last few months since the last episode about bobbin lace making. So we have progressed and maybe you can show us what you made. What is your finished object? Yeah, since the last time I finished this blouse. Back then I think I had already sewn it but not added uh, lace, I guess. I don't remember honestly. <laughs> I think it was the case because back then I hadn't uh, finished the mm. lace for the arms. Mm -hmm. and I think you were working on the mock-up because I think after filming this episode episode we were um, having a fitting for your mock-up yeah right because uh, you had some issues with the sleeves in here with the pleats and yeah true yeah so now it's finished and um, the biggest issues with the fit were solved mm -hmm. especially with the arms because they were way too wide for mm -hmm. my liking mm -hmm. and now we have only this volume down here um, on the shoulders is the lace I bought and here in the front and on the arms is the mm -hmm. ones I made. And for the rest, I'm quite pleased. I just don't like the color yet. I think I have to learn how to make the color best fitting for my mm -hmm. body. Mm -hmm. Because somehow I get some issues with folds from up here down the whole... I would have said that it's too loose around the fore part here. That is yeah. too. That is one problem mm -hmm. too. <laughs> but um, if I make it close sub fitting, mm -hmm. then I get really bad um, folds here, and it really um, mm -hmm. I can feel it. There's mm -hmm. a tension I don't like, so that's why I make it looser. But mm -hmm. definitely, I think I will try to make better with my um, now custom fit dressing form so that I really can see what I'm doing and mm. don't have to try to do it on myself. Yeah. And hopefully I will find a solution for mm. what is actually causing this issue because I had it with every blouse I made so far and I don't know where it comes from. Usual pattern does just don't fit. Mm. <laughs> yeah, so... You talked about in the last episode about bobbin lace making that you wanted to bleach one lace. I think mm -hmm. it's the store bought one. No, the store bought one was okay. really white. I bleached this, this one and this one, and it worked. Oh. And it actually okay. worked. I just used um, washing powder for white fabrics mm -hmm. and some um, bleaching powder. It's usually used for bleaching curtains, mm -hmm. which tend to get a slight yellow tint when they're in the sun for a long time. So I mixed those two parts in a bowl of water and then dipped mm. the lace and it actually... For how long? I think half an hour or so. Yeah. And in the end it, it's not white as if... It's as not as white as... A storeboard yeah. white like, thread would have been. Yeah, but it. Um, I think you can't see it anymore. No. So, and the most important thing to me was that those two match together, mm. and I think it does. So that was yeah. the goal. So that worked fine, and I got the tip from actually when I went to my um, local fabric store and asked if she has any ideas and the idea was the curtain bleach was hers mm. so that was yeah. quite um, helpful yeah, quite an experiment too yeah that's true i was a little bit scared when i started doing it but well i don't think you should do that often or um, mm. with really a harsh bleach mm. but in the end for this it worked out so do you want to repeat once um, what patterns you used for this lace, maybe? Um, I used a pattern from the book one, one, 
101 or 1001? 101. 101 Torchon. Torchon lace patterns, I think it's called. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, there was one really simple pattern. And I used this for both mm. um, laces and... I, I don't remember. I think I worked on it three months in total on all the laces. So three months of bobbin lace for every day. This <laughs> blouse, almost every every really? day. Really? Yeah. I um, approximately ten minutes at least one if every day. Mm. I try okay. to make it a habit to really sit down. Sometimes I just reopen something I did wrong, mm -hmm. but at least I worked on it. Mm -hmm. So. That's mm. was and it also was quite relaxing to do it. Mm. It's yeah. not that relaxing for your back because I always get uh, a bit, little bit of pain in my neck mm. and in my back when I'm making bobbin lace. But yeah, true. For your mind, it is really relaxing. <laughs> yeah, I think we have to find a way to sit properly. I found mm. some images on the. Back in the days, they had really stands for making it, but still, mm. the lace pillow was quite down, uh, quite low. So mm. you always have to lean forward or down. Mm. That's what I find really strange, since my setup is now that uh, the pillow is almost on my um, viewing yeah. height, mm. so that I'm really working high, so that it sits straight. But it's not perfect yeah. either. Also, I pref so you work on a round pillow, so mm. you have your bobbins hanging down on the side of your pillow. But I prefer working on a flat pillow because I don't like to have them falling down always. Mm -hmm. I like to pull some of them apart that I don't work with and just use those that I'm working with, especially when it's a wide strip of lace. So even then, I have to bend down even more than you would do. Yeah, you would have to. That's true. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I pin them to the sides, mm. so I have them out of the okay. way too. But if it gets many of the bobbins, mm. then it's get getting difficult. And yeah. yeah, everyone works differently, and I think every style of making bobbin lace has its own tradition, its own origins. So yeah, everything's valid. Everyone has to find its own way. Yeah, yeah. But I'm really curious how they did it for a long time. I mean. They worked on lace for hours a day. Mm. How did they do it without getting that much back, much back pain? <laughs> or did they ignore I it? That I can't imagine that they just ignore mm. it. I think we have to get a bit deeper into the history of bobbin lace making. And I read a book a few weeks ago. It's more of a novel and not a scientific uh, book or something. But um, it's about a girl who is actually a bobbin lace maker in a um, in an abbey in Belgium, mm -hmm. and the back pain is never mentioned in this book. It's more about her losing her sight, her eyesight, because it's so dark. And at the end of this book, she gets blind because of that. Oh, because she's working like twelve hours a day on this bobbin lace, and yeah. And it she's around 30, I think, or 25. So it's, I think sometimes maybe that they had other things to deal with. Yeah. Because they couldn't sit outside because then the lace would get um, dirty. She couldn't put a fire, light a fire in her room because then the fumes would make the lace dirty as well. So she really had to sit in her room to make her lace without any other than daylight to use. Yeah. Oh, that's not a mm. good way to work. I mean, it's, it's a novel, so I can't guarantee that it really was this way, but, but uh, yeah, we'll have to do some more research in this field, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Another question, what pattern did you use? Maybe you could repeat that as well? Um, it's a pattern from, or basically based on a pattern mm -hmm. from La Mode Illustrée of 1906, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I used a pattern for a blouse which looks 
yeah, similar but different because I changed some things because they didn't mm. work on my body. Especially the back part was completely useless to me. Mm. Um, yeah, but that's the pattern I used and I used it especially for those shoulder pieces because they were al already in the pattern. Mm -hmm. I think this was uh, the main design, uh, how do you say that? This was the most significant part, design part of your blouse, what made, made it special also. To have these panels here yeah. and then the white sleeves. Yeah, absolutely. And um, one significant significant thing I changed too is I reduced a lot of the volume mm. in the front. I mm. think it cut off that much mm. and also cut off the lace. <laughs> Really? Yeah, but I think I'm gonna make a belt mm -hmm. with that lace that I can set the, set the lace in the front mm -hmm. and use it with the blouse because it tends to right up. pull out of the skirt, mm -hmm. which I don't like, and maybe with a belt that would mm -hmm. uh, work better. So I think the lace won't be wasted, but I have to do mm -hmm. the or I have to make this belt. And haven't figured out yet what shape I want. So mm. I really like the V-shaped belts. Me too. Yeah. But I was thinking, do I make a V on the top too, or make do I make it mm. straight, or what V at the back too, or not? And on which mm. height should it sit, and all those things. Mm. <laughs> Is it? Um, well, was it common to attach your blouse to the belt as well? Mm -hmm. Or would you just put it over your blouse? Um, they're both forms. Yeah. There are some um, you just put over it, like um, leather belts mm -hmm. and also metal belts. There were some belts who were just made of metal pieces. Mm -hmm. They Those you would only wear over the blouse mm -hmm. or the skirt. And there are also belts who still have the hooks inside, mostly mm -hmm. at the back. Sometimes at the sides, mm -hmm. seldom at the front. Okay. But then the blouse also had a little loop mm -hmm. where you could hook it in. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that's what I'm going to do, I think, because then if I make a little white or thread loop on the blouse, you wouldn't see it. Yeah. But if I make a re metal hook, you could see it, so... Maybe. Maybe if you use a smaller one. Yeah, I think true. they are quite small metal loops you could use. Yeah. Hooks and eyes, I mean. Yeah. Mm. But I think I will do or make some um, hooks. Sew some hooks onto the belt and then see if I do it for the blouses as well. Mm. Because I want to use or make belts I can switch between the blouses. Yeah, of um... Yeah, but I still have to figure out what form or shape of the belt would fit for my body because I already know that I have to make the belt at the upper part the smallest mm -hmm. and then getting wider, otherwise I would look like I'm cut too high <laughs> at the waistline. Mm -hmm. It depends on the era or the fashion era, but mm. I don't like if my upper body is too, too short, short. Mm. and I want to elongate it and mm. then therefore I would need mm. that shape. I noticed also when I was sewing my blouse that one tends to put as, mu as much volume in the blouse, especially in the front, as you think or as you can. Because you think, oh, these blouses are so frilly and everything, but I think the more you put into it, the more, the wider it looks and the less flattering, the less flattering it does look on your body. So yeah, that that was something I had to learn too, to not put too much fabric on your blouse, even though it's an Edwardian blouse with a lot of frills. Yeah. Of so for this one, I have a lot of material mm. here, which tends to ride to the back sides, which mm. makes me really wide mm. here. Yeah. I think if a little yeah. material would be reduced here in the front, yeah. it would look better. But I just use the pattern as was for mm. the front part. I would change that in the future because I already have quite mm. a wide chest. Mm. 
especially due to climbing my back is also quite wide mm -hmm. and this makes me even wider than I am so but that, then your uh, waist looks smaller that's true too but then I have to find a way to really accentuate the waist mm -hmm. just right now it's not the case mm, yeah because the blouse flows over your waist yeah your skirt yeah. Uh, that's mm -hmm. why I want to make the belt, yeah. which would also put emphasis on the waist. But yeah, it's a project mm -hmm. to, uh, it's a future project, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, so this is the blouse. Mm -hmm. And what are your projects? So I don't have a finished project because I'm, <laughs> I wasn't that motivated to work on this, as you were. My blouse looks like this right now so I had a few issues thanks because I am working on the lace and the blouse at the same time so sometimes a certain step needed to be finished to start the next one and it was codependent of each other so I was struggling all the, all the time to figure out what to do so this is the how the blouse will look like. I will add some lace here, so above the yoke or on the seam line of the yoke. So first I, I had to sew this blouse the way it is to, to see if it fits and then now the next step was to take this pattern and to make the lace in this curved shape of the yoke. So this is why I needed to see if the blouse fits the way it does. So I started with some of the lace for the back part. So the back, uh, the back. <laughs> it's not black. <laughs> <laughs> so the back of the blouse closes here in the back, in the middle back. And then I have these strips of lace that I need to be added. So I have already finished one of those, which is this pattern here. Mm -hmm. So um, there are a few things I'd like to say about this lace. So I made this lace pattern myself. So I, I designed it myself and what I did, I talked about this in the other episode as well. I created the design, I sketched the design on Adobe Illustrator, where I created a brush of this uh, pattern. Then I scanned the pattern piece that I have here of my back. I scanned it and I inserted it into the program. Then I sketched this line of where the lace should sit. And this is how I created this rounded shape for the lace. So there's no, um, it's already, it's all very regularly spread out into the curve. This is why I'm doing this way. Yeah. So this would fit here. Um, let's see how. It's this part here. Yeah, like okay. this. So what I will do is I will probably use this as a real insertion lace. I will not sew it over the blouse, but cut the fabric of the yoke on this part somewhere and then you will really have a see-through part of the blouse. I think the pattern is a bit busy, a bit too busy, I think, but it's in this way it's good because it's not that see-through. You still have a bit of fabric. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this is how I'm working. I think this lace also, it took like a few days to finish. It's not that, it wasn't that difficult and that time consuming to make. Other than my collar that I also finished. I think I spoke about this one as well in the last uh, podcast episode. I finished it finally and then I will sew it onto my neckline like this. Oh, I'm so curious yeah. to see it. This really took a lot of time. I, I'm very bad at counting uh, the hours that I take. Ah, I, always, okay. I always forget to put a timer, so I can't tell you how long it took, but it took quite some time. <laughs> and I think it, these are 20, uh, 39 centimeters, so I put it like this. Wow. <laughs> I'm so excited yeah, to see it. Too. I hope it curves nicely around your around my um, neck. Yeah. Because it's a square piece, and normally uh, um, collars are a bit rounded to fit more closely to your neck. Yeah. So. But 
that's something I found quite strange because I thought colors are always a little bit rounded mm -hmm. but this one is straight too Be mm. and um, almost every color I found in the magazines are straight colors colors mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, that confuses me actually because for me it w doesn't work as you can see um, mm. I would have to ch shape it and I didn't do it yet mm. because I thought it was normal to not, not do it or they expected that someone mm. who sells knows how to do it. I mean you talked about this blouse to me earlier that it doesn't really fit you and the pattern pieces also didn't really match up at certain parts so I don't think that every pattern was tested. Mm, that's back so then. Cool. Yeah. And I really think that you were given the space shape of a straight neckline and were expected to change it to your body shape. Yeah. As this was a skill that was taught and used back yeah. then to really get your patterns to fit you yourself. And there's another thing I learned that you usually would take the pattern from a magazine and go to your tailor mm. or seamstress and let them do it. Mm -hmm. There were very few women who did it actually themselves. Mm -hmm. And you could also buy in the magazines or order um, patterns made to measure. So the patterns we find in the magazines mm -hmm. today are actually not real patterns. They're just basic blocks of patterns. Yeah. Like an inspiration maybe you could change. If you have one color for yourself then you would use this color for other blouses yeah. that have the same width of your neckline or yeah. circumference. Yeah. So that's something yeah. I really want to build for myself. Basically blocks of mm -hmm. um, pattern pieces I can reuse. Yeah. I mean this was the second blouse I made. Mm -hmm. And this one is already better than the green one I did before. Mm -hmm. So my hopes are just that I get better and better each time. You will definitely it. get better with every blouse you make. Yeah. yeah, but then sometimes I really have to force myself to say, okay, I'm wearing that now because mm. it's not perfect, but it's okay. It's okay. I don't mm. look uh, completely no. disheveled. <laughs> so um, yeah, but still, that's the perfectionistic side of me which then says but the blouse isn't good enough and mm -hmm. that's actually not the case but yeah you put so much time in your lace so you should wear it yeah <laughs> and what i also tell myself if i have a blouse in maybe five years from now i really love i can still remake it and reuse the lace mm -hmm. so why not wearing it now yeah. and learning from also wearing it to see mm -hmm. for example that the colors are a little bit too the long cuffs. Uh, the cuffs mm -hmm. <laughs> right that they're a little bit too long so i know it for the next blouse mm -hmm. if i don't wear it i don't know it mm -hmm. yeah so yeah work in progress wearing work in progress <laughs> <laughs> that's the kind of slow fashion we're talking about <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Learning with each piece, each piece and making mm -hmm. it better the next time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For this blouse, just to come back to this one. Sorry. I, no, no worries, it's okay. I'm adding sleeves, like these really wide sleeves here. I added some storeboard lace. I think I will make this as an insertion as well, so I will cut the fabric on the on the back open. Um, I think I'll do the same as you, so I use cuffs that are like this wide. I'm a bit of I'm a bit um, looking as I go, mm -hmm. <laughs> or figuring things out as I go. So this is maybe also why I'm not that motivated because you still have to do the yeah. figuring out yeah. of stuff yeah. and planning. Yeah. I also realized I I did a mock up for this, so I'm not that uh, <laughs> that wild. <laughs> <laughs> I did a mock up, but I used a different fabric, which was a bit stiffer. Mm -hmm. Not that stiff, but it was a bit thicker also. And I realized that with this fabric, even though it was a woven fabric, I, I think it was a bit more elastic or yeah, elastic mm -hmm. as this one because the mock-up fit me perfectly, but this one didn't at first. So mm -hmm. I had to do some, some adjustments still. And it was a cotton fabric. I don't think there was elastane or nylon or something in it. So 
yeah that was a bit strange and also a bit demotivating as well absolutely yeah and I also don't have much fabric of this left so I can't really afford to make, to make any more mistakes oh, with this no. one <laughs> <laughs> I think that makes creative again boundaries make creative yeah. but I also have to get to really motivate myself to just do it so I really tend to when there's a problem in a project to put it aside and to go back to it a few months later I mean I do get back to it so it's better than <laughs> just tossing it in the corner but I tend to just don't figure it out <laughs> maybe it helps to just jot down your thoughts on maybe a piece of paper mm -hmm. over maybe also mm -hmm. weeks you don't have to pressure yourself mm -hmm. to work on it but then when you go back you have mm -hmm. already all the thoughts mm -hmm. you had on a piece of paper mm -hmm. and can work on that i do put i do write down some notes every time but if I have some, <laughs> if I have some <laughs> solutions for my problems. Okay, yeah. Maybe it helps also writing down the problem, so you know the next yeah. time you start yeah. with it. Ah, uh, yeah, that was the problem. Now mm. I can figure that out, mm. and or maybe to talk more about that yeah. with you, to just uh, um, get into the exchange. Mm, yeah, exchanging yeah. thoughts and. I mean, you helped me so much with this mm. blouse and also yeah. the the cottage core blouse with this pattern mm. you're wearing right now i'm making for myself mm. and i think if i had to figure it out completely mm. alone i would still work on it in three months mm. from now i mean you would figure it out but it would take longer so yeah. i think it's also it's always good to yeah exchange to talk about your problems <laughs> in any field of your life it's not definitely about <laughs> yeah <laughs> talk to each other communicate <laughs> communicate with us if you want to <laughs> with this camera in front of us <laughs> yeah yes so this was my project it still is it still is yeah <laughs> <laughs> it sounded like you stop now you won't work on it <laughs> it would be nice if it would magically be done uh, yeah that's true maybe we should sit together and just do stuff like we did in the last video right yeah but they are remanded stuff so maybe yeah. we should make another mm. time to sew mm. or as we did um making mock-ups or something mm. i hate doing mock-ups but it was fun to, to do it together at least for me yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice for you <laughs> yeah but making a mock-up mock takes so much time true and I'm just a bit sloppier when sewing a mock-up than with sewing the real piece. So still do your mock-ups. It's important. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't have noticed in, uh, in time that, for mm. example, the blouse I'm making right now would not fit at all. Mm. So what I really like to do with this kind of blouse that you mentioned, which are like pieces you wear on a daily basis it's not a costume for me but like a daily thing I like to use one pattern that fits all <laughs> so if I have a basic pattern that I know that fits me then I just do some exchange exchanges put the seams on another place for example and then I know it fits me and for modern garments that are not that uh, complicated construction wise I tend to just sew it yeah. Also, if I know that I have enough fabric left, so yeah, I don't always do mock-ups. Of course, for historical projects with other construction methods, with other shapes, depending on the corset or the undergarments you wear, I really do this, and it's quite important, I'd say. But for modern garments, I not always do this. Yeah, but there you have this basic pattern already. Mm. I didn't mm. have it yet, yeah. so mm. I have to make this one, and then I mm. will probably to just alter this one and use it for different stuff mm, yeah. but first i have to get there that's the goal for the next month you will see okay. it maybe next time i will check on that <laughs> <laughs> now i um, have a uh how do you call it uh i don't know what you mean accountability um, uh, okay yeah 
partner. <laughs> okay, I'm your accountability partner. Okay. Yeah. So we have yeah. said that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I guess that's the project that's it for my um, yeah for my work in progress. Okay, so I don't have anything in work in progress right now for mm-hmm. Bobbin Lies. I just switched back to sewing for now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Hopefully, I will get back to Bobbin Lies soon. But that's it for this category. Yeah, it's time for From the Archives and Clara has to show us, has something to show us. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. So you might remember this petticoat that I showed you in episode two, I think. Mm -hmm. I wanted to talk a little bit more about the lace that I made because I think that was a bit left behind in this podcast, in the other podcast episode. So I... The, the lace on the bottom is store-bought, but the ones, the lace strips on the top are self-made. So I have two types of lace that I made. This one here is made of a little bit of a thicker linen thread that I just used a basic linen stitch bobbin lace pattern for. So my goal was to, of course, to have fun with the lace I make, but also to be more time efficient and to still get it done in a realistic amount of time so for these i think there are two of these strips here for these i used a thicker lace with this very simple linen stitch pattern so it's just linen stitch for like a centimeter one and a half centimeters and then i take the bobbins as a as pairs and make a whole stitch i think it's a whole stitch yeah <laughs> and then i continue with this linen stitch pattern which creates these holes in the middle, which I find quite interesting. For the other pattern, I used a base pattern for inspiration, which is this one here. It's a strip taken from the book Wiener Spitzen by Hartmut Lang, I think Mm -hmm. that's his name. I think so too. Um, Which is a half stitch and then it's, I have forgotten the name of the pattern in the middle. It has a specific name as well. Um, I used this pattern because it's, the half stitch is quite fast to make. It's not that durable, it's quite stretchy, this lace, you might see it here. Um, but I wanted to use it because it was also very fast to make and I really like the result as an insertion lace, for mm-hmm. example. So what I did is I, I used this pattern as a base and then I changed the part in the middle. There are three different lace designs so every strip is a bit different just to make it a little bit more interesting also for me when making the lace so this for example i think i sent you a picture reminds me of sauron yeah. <laughs> a lot of the rings the eye of a lot sauron. Of the eye of sauron yes this one is a bit different because there every second um, design has a whole stitch yes a whole stitch added to the eye and the third one is even more a bit different because I added this other piece here it's a bit difficult to explain in words but yeah this is what I made in the end it yeah it didn't it, it didn't really feel like a lot of work but it probably was I made this last year and I don't really remember how much time I put into it <laughs> but it was fun the whole petticoat was fun. Yeah. And there are still threads coming, coming out. out. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the thing about um, having made or wearing self made mm. garments. You always find some loose threads. Yeah. You lose a little piece of your garment every time <laughs> you wear it. <laughs> Is that slow it fashion dissolves. too? <laughs> dissolves very slowly into pieces. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds so sad. <laughs> it isn't sad, no. I really like also the combination of white and yellow. It reminds me of ice cream. <laughs> Ooh, okay. I think, I think it looks, especially here at the bottom, I think it, for me it looks like ice cream. I don't what know. What ice? I don't think um, of yellow eyes <laughs> mango eyes for ah. example is very yellow 
combined with, with banana. Banana ice is more of a white mm-hmm. beige color. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I see. I don't know. So it's a summer It's the association coat. I have with this dress. Wait. Yeah. It's perfect for summer. Yeah. Or even in winter when you're longing for ice. Yeah. I don't do that that often, but it happens. <laughs> <laughs> I really like stripes in a way. I also really like a lot of historical Edwardian skirts with stripes. I'd love to make a seaside outfit one day. Yeah. Like even the classic ones in dark blue and white, they look really cool. And I also think those skirts where the um, stripes um, meet in points, mm-hmm. for example, yeah, at the chevron. front. Chevron, uh, yeah. I'm not sure what it's called, but chevrons are these uh, pointed okay. patterns. So. I think that's really cool too. Mm. Maybe one day making a pattern for that mm-hmm. would yeah. be great. Yes, this is my, my project from the archives from last year. Cool. Yeah. So, <clears throat> basically we're done now with our project that we made. So now we come to our next category, which is future projects. So Nani, do you have a future project that you want to talk about? That yes, you would like to start the next few months or years. Mm. <laughs> Hopefully see. months, because it's on my list for quite a while now. I got from uh, how to start the story behind it. <laughs> Actually, I was buying some brooches, brooch, brooches, brooches, online uh, on eBay, and. Apparently, this person googled me (laughs) and found our podcast and she thought that her collection of lace needs a new home (laughs) and someone who would maybe use it. So she sent it to me and now I have this box. Voila. (laughs) Full of lace. It's already spilling over. So with all kinds of lace. Also. All kinds of lace. There's crocheted lace in there, um, bobbin lace. There are insertion laces. There are um, that's um, white embroidery. I think. White embroidery. Okay. And there's quite white a bunch. Work. White work. I think it's white work. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I thought I would use some of it and make a blouse out of it, an mm. insertion lace blouse. That's the goal. But I haven't thought about a pattern. I haven't mm. thought which laces I would use. I um, What I know is that I want to use laces with a similar color because here are some which are a little bit brownish, others which are mm. more yellowish. Either I'm going to bleach them also, or I'm going to try to match the mm. colors. Will you also try to match the technique? Do you have only have like bobbin lace or only uh, crochet lace? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't thought about it yet. I think I will try to match techniques, but if there is some or one I really like, together with another, mm. I would combine them. Mm-hmm. I, I haven't spread them out entirely. I didn't took everything and laid it out. I think that's the first step to do and then mm-hmm. pick the ones I want to combine and see what I get. I mean, now that you have your dress form, you could just drape then drape the lace pieces on your dress form and then fill Ooh. the holes with fabric. I haven't thought about yeah. that yet. True, absolutely. Yeah, that would make things way easier. <laughs> I mean, you can do this with um, piece with a blouse that's really close fitting to your body. Yeah. When you plan on making a loose fit, then it's a bit more difficult. Yeah. Then I would sew the blouse first and then put insert. on the lace. Yeah. Yeah. But maybe for I think I would like to try something which is quite um, fitting around the 
upper body, mm -hmm. shoulders and mm -hmm. chest area. There I could place the lace already mm -hmm. and then for the rest first make the blouse and then add the lace. Mm -hmm. But I think that's something I would try mm -hmm. and do it actually and then decide what I do. Did like that you make plan any sense? Beforehand and then you... yeah, usually I plan the pattern mm -hmm. beforehand and in this case I would plan which lace I would use and then plan the pattern. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Makes sense. Hopefully. <laughs> Just go with the flow and yeah, yeah, do some sort of experiments. Yeah, that's the idea. And I mean, there's so much lace. If you want to make another blouse, I guess mm. we could make four blouses of it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so mm. that it would use be used. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, that's the plan. I don't know when I will start with it because there are so many projects on my list. Mm -hmm. But I really would love to do it. Mm -hmm. Well, now winter comes, so I'm not sure if I will do it right now or in the winter for the summer. I don't know. We're gonna see. <laughs> but, yeah. But I don't think I'm gonna make lace for it. I just use the lace yeah. I have. <laughs> I mean, you said to me earlier that you'd like to start another bobblehead project. But that's true, then you really have to know what to use it for. Yeah, and that's what mm -hmm. I don't know yet. So I think it's easier to start with that and use it because otherwise I would it would just lay around and that would mm -hmm. be sad. So that's for me. That's my future project. And what are your future projects? So when I bought the fabric for the white blouse that I showed you earlier, I got the same fabric in this light blue color that I really liked. And I'm planning on making another blouse with this one as well. I put a picture here of a blouse that I found in a magazine. I colored it in this light blue color to see how it would look like. And I'm, plan to, I'm planning to use this antique lace here. I really, really don't remember where it comes from. I think it's from an antique market or an antique uh, shop in France, maybe. But I really like it. And this uh, blouse pattern that I'm trying to make, there's quite a lot of lace all over the blouse, which is why I think it's perfect to use it. I have four and a half meters, it's not that much. Mm, let's see. Maybe I still have to find another one that fits to this kind of lace. I wanted to use this lace for the other blouse, but as it's quite tinted, I don't think it fits. Have you washed it? No. So maybe if you wash it, uh, it's not that tinted anymore. But then it would be sad because this tinted color really fits to this. Uh, <laughs> it would what? be even worse <laughs> yeah, if, if you were... washed your blouse yeah. and it doesn't fit anymore. Yeah. So maybe you should wash it before. Yeah. It's good that you... Yeah that you said that to remember this yeah this is the blouse i'm planning to make but as we said it's a future project i have a few projects to finish first and with our future projects we usually tend to use some books or the internet but in <laughs> my <laughs> case i quite often right now use this book here it's called um ich kann schneidern so i can tailor in english it's from 1906 or 5 or 4 or 10. <laughs> 1909. None of the mentioned ones. So, yeah. And it's basically a teaching book for young ladies who learn to sew. And every garment is mentioned um, how to make the basic mm -hmm. things like how to sew in a sleeve or how to make a dart, um, how to sew buttonholes mm -hmm. and there are also basic patterns and the really cool thing about it, it is in the internet I tend to find um, resources on in English or French mm -hmm. and it's old English or old French and this is old German too, but I speak German as my 
first language so it's easier to understand and to compare what in German is written and in French or English makes so much more sense in a way. So if it's described here, I can easily transfer it to what is written somewhere in English or in French. So this has become a really um, important source for mm -hmm. me to understand the techniques, how to sew the things I want to sew. Mm -hmm. Because, well, I'm not a seamstress and I'm not a pattern maker. Mm -hmm. These are the things I learn by doing it. So using my mother language makes it a little easier. I think even modern seamstresses and um, they do learn techniques that are used today. So they wouldn't necessarily know how to make a garment from the 1900s, for example. Yeah. And even then, I think you were you sent me once a uh, part of this book, like mm -hmm. a page, uh, a photograph of a page. And even then in this book, they are using words that we don't use anymore. Yeah, that's true. Or words that we do know, but in a different context. Yeah. Which don't make that much sense when reading it in this book. So it's quite inter interesting to learn about German language as well. Yeah. And also in the beginning of the book, there is a chapter about fabrics and um, what to buy, what to look for if you mm. buy a fabric. And somehow the things you look for haven't changed that much mm. but others have changed completely like the fabric doesn't exist anymore today it was talked about linen how to uh, know if the linen is good or not mm -hmm. we don't have the variety of linen anymore not especially if you buy it in store and mm -hmm. try to feel it stores. I think that in a way they still do exist, but in really specialized factories. Yeah, and yeah. you usually don't get them as easily. Especially as a private person, that's not a salesman or so, a saleswoman, salesman. Yeah. yeah, that's why I use this book quite often. And I really have to be careful that because it starts to fall apart, I'm mm. thinking about dig digitizing it, mm. but I don't know yet how to do it. So do you know if there's an English version of this book? I haven't found an English version. I only have found a Dutch version yet. <laughs> so um, maybe it's available in English if you know mm. how it's called. I can tailor, I haven't found it. But yeah, mm. I think on continental Europe, it is definitely a Dutch version out there. So I assume there would be a French too. But if it's in English, I don't know. I think there's still a lot of English instructional books out there. So if this yeah. one doesn't exist, then there will be others out there. In yeah, English. absolutely. I mean, I still I have one, which is the Victorian Authentic Dressmaking Techniques, I think it's called, which is a bit similar. Yeah, Maybe not that detailed, as detailed as this one, but there are a lot of books yeah. about this topic. It helps definitely to have a book in your own language of that time. Mm. So you can see how they described things, how they made things and then mm. transfer it to the other language or mm. back. I think if you have the possibility to use many different languages, especially with translation tools, I mean, mm. I'm lucky to have learned French, English and Dutch, so I can use quite a variety of sources but more often than not I use translation tools too yeah. especially if I use Spanish sources which are quite interesting too and especially when they pick the stuff from the French magazines <laughs> so you can compare it <laughs> yeah so just my recommendation is to have one source in your own language and then spread out and use the different languages too Especially with the translation tools we have nowadays. Yeah, so that's for me. What about your book? My book is a bit different. <laughs> this is about lace making. It's about the lace, bobbin lace from Bayeux, which is in northern France, in Normandy. I picked this one because I'm always interested in, in seeing different lace techniques and how they vary around even in Normandy there's so... Normandy is just one region of France and still there are so many different lace making techniques just in this region. Mm. 
And as part of my family comes from Bayeux, I wanted to have this book and see what it's about and uh, maybe learn this lace making technique. So one typical feature of Bayeux lace is a gimp that is used. So which is kind of a surrounding of your bobbin lace ground, like you can see here. Which makes this a really interesting design feature, I'd say, because the lace looks quite distinctive. Mm -hmm. Like you can see on... On this page, for example, you can really make create a motif, like a floral motif in this case, and make it stand out even better when having a gimp. So I wanted to learn to do that because I haven't used gimps before in bobbin lace. The thing that I did most was torsion lace, so this is a new thing for me. But I haven't had the time yet because this lace is also really fine and I don't know yet what I would use it for, so I'd, I'd love to incorporate it into a project, but... Have you yeah. seen the skirt which is in the Musée Baron de Girard in Bayeux? I wasn't in the museum. There are uh, images online. Um, with, this is why I found um, this museum. It's a skirt completely made of black lace, black mm -hmm lace of Bayou, Bayou lace mm -hmm. and so amazing mm -hmm. there are really flowers in there mm -hmm. and um, leaves and yeah but I think was it constructed as one piece or was it sewn together I think it was sewn together at some point probably yeah, yeah. but uh, you can't see it so mm -hmm. it was done um, so se yeah basically seamlessly okay and I don't think that would be a project uh, fit for one person. No. But I find the idea so cool. Mm. I would, it would be so valuable that I wouldn't want to wear it. Anyway. <laughs> and you would spend years of your life just making it. Mm -hmm. So I prefer doing something like this, for example. Not a doily, but use a lace edging, maybe for a garment, for a project. But even this is so fine, it's way thinner and finer than the lace we make here, so... Do you have the threads already? I have one thread, I don't know if it's the matching uh, thinness. Mm. I'm not sure. But, I mean, this looks a bit more simple for the beginning. Yeah. But it looks yeah. like ice. I don't like ice. Ice? Yeah. Why ice? Like. Eyes. I thought you meant like ice cream. Eyes. So, <laughs> no, the eye. Okay. <laughs> like it's uh, looking at me. I don't know why I have this association, but you could put a thread through this, like eyelet lace. Yeah, it's true. Then you can also use it for, for example, um, putting it in a little mm -hmm. bit for a uh, uh, mm -hmm. yoke part or something. Mm -hmm. This one I like. Really. So, this one? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's very simple but cute. Yeah, Yeah. so this book, I would have wished to have more of a historical background when buying this book. There's one or two, There are one or two pages covering the history, but it's not that uh, detailed. So I'd love to learn more about this, but then information are really rare. Maybe I would have to go to the museum one day, but that's not planned in the near future sadly yeah maybe we should do a trip we already talk about doing a trip yeah. to france but uh, i'd love to one day to go back to france <laughs> <laughs> that's basically what we have to show you today but don't leave right now because we have a guest again and clara tell us about a guest so her name is emeline um, she is part of a uh, historical dancing association, which we find really interesting. I think she will talk a bit about that. She's also doing a lot of historical reenactment. This time we decided to make an interview. We haven't done this before, so this is the first time. Enjoy. Take your cup of tea again. <laughs> and yeah. So welcome, Eveline, to this uh, podcast. Uh, we're both very happy that you're here and maybe you can start about yourself, where you come from, what's got you started into historical costuming. And what you do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, thank you girls for having me in this podcast. I'm very happy to be here. 
so uh, I am Emeline. I am 26 years old. I turned 26 two months ago. Um, in in life outside the historical costuming, I am a graphic designer, and I am giving uh, graphic design classes. Um, I started um, I started um, reenactment in in 2017. Mm -hmm. So it's been like pretty much five years and a half. Mm -hmm. And I started with um, historical dancing. Uh, it was in Paris back then. Uh, and there is a lot of historical associations in Paris, but I think it's pretty much the same with all the big capitals and cities. I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure in Berlin, you have like the most yes. historical association as yeah. well. Um, so I started with the historical dancing and it was um, second empire dancing because um, Napoleon III uh, is really uh, one of the biggest, um, biggest uh, historical figures we have in France for the 19th century. And, and like, yes, uh, second empire reenactment is really a big thing in France. So I started with this thing um, and then I studied Belle Epoque. I did a bit of uh, First Empire as well but for the moment is really my least favorite era because I, I just don't like how the dresses fits me because I, you see I am pretty tall and flat girl so just not the typical First Empire silhouette so I'm still figuring out how to pull out a good empire, first empire on me. Uh, <laughs> not succeeded so far, but... Uh, Maybe one day. <laughs> yes, and I changed association over the years. Now I am the secretary of a dancing historical association called Le Ballet Imperial in Paris. Uh, I am doing it uh, remotely uh, because I am now in Lyon. Uh, and of course, I am traveling for the events and things like that, but mostly it's uh, remote for the moment. I just need some time away from Paris. Mm, I understand. <laughs> and so, outside, so with this association, we do to um, dancing reenactments. So, it's the balls, mostly the balls of the good society in the second half of the 19th century. Uh, we are um, looking forward to do more, uh, how could I put that, popular dancing. Mm -hmm. uh, I really want to do like, like a barrière ball, uh, you know, uh, in the late uh, 19th centuries in Paris, uh, near the Moulin Rouge and Moulin mm -hmm. de la Galette. Uh, there was a lot of uh, popular people who went dancing and it's really not the same dances we have in the high society. And it's really worth a uh, reenactment uh, as well. So we are trying to look forward to it uh, in the next years. And outside of uh, the dancing, uh, I am also um, part of a reenactment association uh, specialized in the first year of the World, World War I. Uh, so it's the year when in France we had uh, the blue and the red costumes. It, it was not uh, the typical light blue costume that we had at the end of the mm. war. Uh, so it's really the beginning and I am doing uh, the nurse uh, for this association and we are doing a lot of camping um, in, in festivals, uh, in mostly multi-historical festivals. I don't know if you have that in Germany. Um, yeah, most of it is uh, medieval festivals. Yeah. There are many multi-historical ones. They're oh, so more medieval, me medieval, medieval, yeah. and um, fantasy combined, yeah. like steampunk or that, but okay. not mm. historically. There are some that touch more on the Rococo fashion, but even then, it's mostly multi. Uh, Fashion okay. era style. <laughs> so maybe it's a French thing, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think in France and also in England, I feel like these kinds of reenactment mm -hmm. things are more a thing than in Germany. I don't know why. Too bad. But I mean, we as a German, to... we wouldn't also. Get that in Germany. Do... <laughs> Sorry? What? We have to get that in Germany. Yes, yeah, we have to organize great. that. But it's I mean, so in, Germ 
in Germany, it's a bit difficult to do a World War One reenactment or even World War Two. It's not that. <laughs> I can Luckily. see why. <laughs> I understand why. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. That's, that's a really yeah. interesting thing to, I think, to interrogate as well. Very mm. huge subject, but yeah. I, I think it's worth uh, to to think about it mm. uh, someday. And so, uh, with this uh, World War One Association, mm -hmm. um, this weekend we are leaving for the countryside, uh, the Aubrac. Uh, it is a very beautiful countryside in the right in the middle of France, like if you do a cross and like it's pretty much the center of it. Okay. Uh, and it's a really beautiful landscape because uh, very few villages. So it's one of the best places to see the nocturnal skies in France. It's really a protected okay. uh, protected area. Mm -hmm. okay. And so uh, we are going to do a Belle Epoque weekend uh, between us, there is no no public, no no need to do some um, no need to do teachings or things like that. Mm -hmm. It's really uh, between us. Uh, so I am going to do my suitcase for the weekend, and I thought I could present you uh, everything I'm going to put uh, in my suitcase for a Belle Epoque weekend. We'd love that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we are going to start with the underpinnings. Okay, so this bad guy who went away um <laughs> it's like uh, i don't know how you could say it in english a certai it's not a proper corset uh, it's smaller um this one isn't historically accurate i brought it uh, on the internet so it's really like a middle middle quality not not too bad mm -hmm. not too expensive uh, I couldn't afford a better one because corsetry mm. is really, really expensive, and mm. I know why. But mm -hmm. like my budget couldn't uh, couldn't follow. So for the moment, I have a small one for the waist when I need to because I use this one in summer because I need to breathe a little more mm. and it's really uh, lightweight. So I I I see uh, I have seen on the internet that they have uh, in they had in summer like you know those. Kind of corset with um, a small mesh in the with with mesh, mm -hmm. and I really want to have one for summer. Um, so maybe one day I will give it a try and sew it myself. But I'm very very scared of corsetry. It seems so difficult. So for the moment, mm -hmm. I don't get this one. Um, I wanted to say also that um, we we I think in a historical community we we make a great deal about wearing corsets uh, between everything. And I, as I understand it, like for uh, anterior period, such as Second Empire, if you don't wear a corset uh, when you have a Second Empire gown, uh, especially with the crinoline, it is all going to fall on your on your back your hips, and it's yeah. going to hurt. Mm -hmm. But really for Belle Epoque, sometimes it, I think if you if you are really bad when you in your corset, like if you have really strong abs and, and it, it doesn't shrink when you wear a corset mm -hmm. uh, and if sometimes you really don't feel like it then don't it's mm -hmm. it's not that much a big deal and if you put all the other underpinnings so yeah maybe it's going to be a little more uh less uh, less uh, stiff at the at the waist but really uh, unless you are like this close from the person it's not something people will remark so mm -hmm. Comfort first, always. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. really important to to say it because even if the corset is really important and it's uh, something we have to show to people and also to explain, it wasn't uh, such a torture instrument they they need to see. It's also important to to say to the reenactor that if you don't feel like wearing one today and if you don't have the according type like if it's too hot and you don't have a mesh corset and you know you are going to faint if you wear this one because it is not adapted to the weather just don't priority to safety absolutely uh, then we have uh, the um, like chemise <laughs> to absorb you know the sweats mm -hmm. so i love this one i i think it's uh, i i found this one on vintage uh, mm -hmm. I think it's, nice. uh, it's not Belle Epoque, it's later, I would say the 1920s, uh, it's my favorite one, I love like all the, the little... Is that embroidery? Uh, yeah. No, it's like a, a broderie White. anglaise, I don't know. Um... White work, I'd say. Yes, Yeah. it's really, really darling, and I love this one. Um, 
Uh, I wore it so often that the um, the straps the, the straps <laughs> yeah. fell apart, and I have to to sew them back together several times. But it is really lightweight, so I love it. I love it mm. for summer. I have this one. This one is more ancient uh, because uh, you know, like the texture of the fabric, like it has this really particular way to fold down. Uh, that when you touch it, you, ooh, this is really ancient. So um, I like this one also. Uh, it is very, very uh, covering the armpits really well. So um, my favorite body to absorb sweat. <laughs> <laughs> really good. <laughs> of course, uh, the I don't know how you you call that in English. Uh, in French, we say cache corset. Corset cover. Yeah. Okay, it's the so same. As yeah. simple as that. But yeah. the corset cover. Uh, this one is the, the first that I sew, hand sew. Mm -hmm. um, it's a truly Victorian pattern. Mm -hmm. uh, really easy to follow. Uh, I want to do a second time but with uh, more. Uh, this one is pure cotton. Uh, so very practical, very uh, middle class. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, I am uh, wanting to do one uh, more, uh, you know, more elaborate with much thinner fabric because nice, uh, awesome. with, uh, the Ballet Imperial Association, uh, we do uh, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, habillage, uh, dressing up, uh, um, uh, um, I forgot the word, shoot, uh, <laughs> conference talks, Maybe uh, yeah, yeah, talks, yes. conferences. And so as we are um, showing much more higher class, um, higher class clothing, uh, I want to do one which is uh, shooting higher class so it can be shown and displayed a bit uh, during those talks. Mm -hmm. So, and of course. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, vintage as well. Um, I, I think like vintage and things like that, are, uh, sites like that are really, really great for finding uh, old uh, old garments that nobody ever wants, but we customers <laughs> are really uh, searching after. Um, we haven't we found any in Germany find, no, on vintage. Uh, very, very pretty. Like you mm. see those embroidery on the... Like mm -hmm. small embroideries, uh, yeah. really, really, really sweet, and uh, it's short. So for Belle Epoque, it's perfect because I have a longer one that I sewed for uh, Second Empire, but it, it won't fit for for Belle Epoque. Then my favorite part, <laughs> the petticoats. Yay! <laughs> I, I really love this one. Mm, uh, the lace is beautiful at the bottom. Painted as well. Uh, it ha it has like. Um, kind of um, macrame thing, I don't know, like, you know, it, it looks like in just the, the things you put on the on the tables when you're in a grandma's house, like, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but I, I didn't know that they had these on petticoats. Uh, this one, I think, is authentic, uh, maybe uh, 18, 1890s. Uh, I can tell um, because of those things at the back. You know, there, there is some extra, uh, extra, extra Plums. layers of fabric uh, mm. to do like a bit of a bump on the. Ah, on the, okay. That's um, so smart. Yes, and they had a lot of things like these uh, during the Belle Epoque era. So, and it's so specific. Uh, I think this one is authentic. I have small doubts because it is a very like it is perfect condition. So I am I am having small doubts, but this thing at the back like it's it's too specific for 1890s and beginning of uh, uh, 20th century. Also like you know the these little dots in the front uh, to to flatten the the whole thing. It's really really screaming 1890s to me. So yeah. I am, it's my favorite petticoats and I am bringing it everywhere. It is uh, really my favorite piece. Uh, I am also adding this one, which is more specific. And I, I didn't, uh, it's not finished, but I, I, uh, I thought I could present it any, uh, anyway. It's a princess petticoat. Uh -huh. uh, it had these uh, in the 1890s. This one, uh, I sew it myself. It's from a historical pattern as well. Um, it was at the beginning. It was like the lining of a princess dress, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. but I didn't like how the dress turned out. I wore it <laughs> one time, and instead of throwing all away, I just um, just uh, hence and stitched the the fabric part and then made it uh, in another gown. And I kept uh, the under layers as it was because it is perfect to do a princess petticoat. They were really popular in the 1890s because um, you have less bulk at the waist when you wear mm. these. So it's, uh, it helps achieving, like, you know, with really wasp, uh, wasp silhouette things. Yeah. So I need to finish this one, but I am hoping to bring it in the weekend. It's really heavy uh, and uh, I think it has great potential when, when I, uh, I will overcome my laziness <laughs> and finish the work. So that's all for the underpinnings. I am like trying to find somewhere to put these because uh, my office is not extensible. <laughs> and then I have the blouses and chemise. So mm -hmm. this one is a short sleeved one. Um, uh, I had doubts for short sleeves uh, for Belle Epoque, but I've seen some pictures with uh, women wearing short sleeves in summer, so mm -hmm. I think it it it, uh, it can be uh, it, it it can be something that I can pull out. Um, I love like all the details in front, like really oh, really Belle yeah. Epoque inspired. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is modern. Uh, found it on Vinted as well, but it is a French brand uh, made of uh, linen, so it stays, uh, the, the fabric stays historically accurate. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it does the job pretty well. And also, like, uh, this is another thing I wanted to point out. It's not, um, it's not uh, that dramatic if the, um, the, the outfits you are is made of parts, some part of modern clothing, um, mm -hmm. because... Uh, First of all, um, fashion is a circle, so <laughs> you can find modern garments with a lot of um, historical inspiration and can be, a, and it is accurate, it is accurate. And I think, I don't know which costumer it was, I think it's Karenia Zebrowska, uh, one or two years ago, that posted about a, um, a pullover from H&M. Uh, which had really like the the, the perfect puffed sleeves, yeah. sleeves. I remember. So so it's it's okay to to use modern clothes uh, because sometimes you have the um, the same um, the same shape. So <laughs> why, why bother if it is the same shape? It, it can pass as well. Uh, no problem. Like this um, this shirt I am I am having as well uh, is a is from the um, 1980. Uh, in the 1980, you know, like the big, mm -hmm. <laughs> big shoulders, uh, and so we had a lot of things, um, really, really 1890 as well. Uh, and if uh, people happen to find some garments from the 70s, uh, there is also a lot of things that that are screaming Belle Epoque fashion. So mm -hmm. unless it is very obvious details like zippers and things like that, of course, maybe it's best to avoid that. But if it's some simple shirts. And um, uh, how can I say that? Like um, skirts that can pass with buttons and, and ju just do it. Uh, yeah. Because uh, historical, uh, historical and authentic garments are expensive as hell, <laughs> if I may say. Uh, this, one, this one was made for me by my grandmother. So I really love this shirt. A very simple um, with a, uh, in France, we say Col Claudine. I don't know if we have another word for that. Mm. I think sometimes it's also called Peter Pan color. Like oh, yes, shape. Peter Pan color. Yes, yeah. that's it. <laughs> uh, so this is my nurse shirt. Uh, so white, of course. Uh, I, it is really lightweight as well. So for summer and for things in when you have to, to move a lot, it's it's pretty 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 good. And this one, so I am going to show you one of my most treasured pieces. Uh, it's a linen blouse with uh, bishop sleeves. Oh, that's beautiful. Like mine. <laughs> I love, I don't know how to, to sh show it, mm -hmm. like, and doing it just like bishop sleeves are, are so beautiful and so hard to pull out. In fact, it's really a complicated piece to sew, in my opinion. Um, this one is not authentic, it's, uh, it was hand sewn. 
Uh, it is uh, modern and it is made by a historical uh, reenactor, um, which name is uh, Sylvia Quint. She's from Finland and uh, I like the person very much uh, uh, as I like her work. And so I am very glad I had the money at one moment to, to buy these blows uh, because it's it's just so beautiful. I, I, I just love the original sleeves, you know, so, mm. so yeah, one of my favorite treasure. <laughs> Yeah, it's really distinctive of the era, so it's really easy to, when you have those sleeves to yes. look more authentic. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, I have like skirts because uh, I think I am going to to leave with only this skirt because I am not staying that long. So, um, how many days are you staying there? Um, Four days. So, sorry, I'm really bad, I'm bad at counting. I need to, to have everything by hand. Uh, four days. And I have also uh, a dress that I'm going to show you later. And my um, my nurse uh, dress. So no need to, to gather too much, uh, too much other skirts. So mm -hmm. this one, I really like the color. Very simple. Can work for summer, for autumn, for winter. Like just, just perfect. Um, this one is more a late uh, 1890 shape uh, with a lot of pleating. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to ask to forgive me. I'm really bad at pleating, but I am trying. <laughs> but you have a lot of pleats on the back. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, it's, it's for, you know, for this uh, extra volume on the on the bum. Um, I didn't have... Uh, so this one was made for an event uh, and I, I was um, aware of this event very at the last moment. So I didn't have uh, that much time to pull out an outfit. So I did this uh, like in one afternoon without any pattern. <laughs> so I just rushed everything. It, I had the chance. It didn't come out so bad and I am um, having it uh, in lots of events. Uh, the only only thing that I have to regret about this fabric is that it, it's uh, having a lot of, um, how can I say that, like, you know, it's a sapli, ça, ça, ça froisse. It wrinkles quite yes. fast. A lot of wrinkles. And it, so uh, when I use it, I always have to bring my steamer with me <laughs> because oh, no. even if I try to do like the Mary Kondo thing and mm -hmm. <laughs> bleeding everything, it still shrinks. <laughs> It makes me mad. Mm. Uh, and then I have uh, another summer dress. It's a wrapping dress. Oh, this uh, one's cute. Yes, it's giving really like uh, Wendy Darling vibes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so uh, it's really like a 1909, 1910 thing. You, you still have the pigeon bustle at the front obviously uh, i am not wearing it now so it's difficult to to see but uh, there is a lot of uh, pleats gathered in the front uh, to do this pigeon breast um and it's closed uh, on the on the front mm -hmm. like uh, like kind of um, a peignoir a kimono i don't know mm -hmm. um I, I did this one without a pattern as well um because patterns are also very extensive and sometimes yeah. like when it's like um, for the 1909-1910 fashion it's like really much um, rectangles that you sew together so it's not like uh, that uh, uh, that essential to have patterns if you know a little bit what you're doing obviously I did this this year I w it would have been impossible for me to do it like my first year of reenactment it it takes a little bit of experience but at one moment, if I have a, like a a man queen and some some, mm. some fabric, I'm just putting everything uh, and see uh, how it goes. Uh, I use, however, uh, some some pages of um, the the blog of a, an American historical uh, sewer. She uh, Angela Clayton. Ah yes, I know her. Yeah. So I used uh, so it's based on on a model made by Angela Clayton. So mm -hmm. I didn't patterned uh, as 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 she had, but uh, I, I like um, followed uh, her steps mm -hmm. and 
she does a lot of driving <laughs> too, so it's quite easy to follow then. Mm -hmm. she, yeah. she is really clear in her explanation and I like his blog, her, her blog very much uh, because uh, she has also a fun way to do things and she's not like that uh, gatekeeping the thing. Yeah. Like, she, she really is really lightweight and really chill. Mm -hmm. So I, I like her vibes really very much mm -hmm. and I like uh, the pattern she pulled out. Mm -hmm. I didn't brought one but like uh, I have mm -hmm. my eyes on one of her 1890s uh, skirt patterns with buttons on the front. I really, really want that one. So uh, maybe one day. Um, the nurse outfits. So there is a lot of things going on with the nurse outfits. Um, it's a French Red Cross nurse outfit. Um, the main difference uh, between the French Red Cross nurses and the Red Cross nurses, like from the UK, for example, um, is that in France we don't have uh, that much reference for um, uh, and that much rules for the outfits uh, in in Great Britain they had uh, if I could put it like that they had the time to prepare this, themselves and reorganize uh, what the nurses would wear and in how how many quantities of shirts they had uh, in france for obvious reason we didn't have time uh, to to plan that, that thing so we, we just did with what we had what we had so um my, my outfit is based on a model in the musée de la grande guerre de Meaux in the parisian region so first uh, there is the apron um, I like this one because in the um, in the um, uh, in the images I used uh, the um, the apron is pleated. Mm -hmm. There is no um, no pockets, but it's pleated, and uh, I found it pretty pretty uh, distinct. And I think I am in all white, however, so maybe do uh, have this little fantasy to have a bit of texture. And it's also not the usual uh, the usual apron we are we are seeing, and it might worth the shot. And people are liking it so far, so I am really happy about it. Um, so yes, but most of the time, uh, I don't know why it, it might be really, really at the beginning of the um, of the war, uh, because I, I it's really pretty. But I don't see why it didn't have pockets. Like it's not practical, <laughs> but. Uh, as my, my troop is doing really early uh, World War I, uh, it's okay. Uh, then we have... Oh, sorry, uh, everything is shrink because I didn't have time to uh, iron this costume. But as it's white, maybe it will not show too much. We don't see that, it's okay. <laughs> so uh, this is the veil mm -hmm. with the red cross in the center. Um, they had lots of veils and aprons because, uh, for obvious reasons, they really quickly stained. Um, the, the veil was essential to protect also uh, the nurse from um, the spilling in the hair and everything, but also uh, the patient, because if there is some nurse hair that, that can go in, into the, the wounds, it's not like uh, hygienical. So it's really an important piece and it was worn like uh, if I can show it, really like covering, um, covering all the um, all this area. Sometimes I see uh, nurses wearing it a bit like that to to show some loose hair. So it's really pretty, but um, this uh, thing is really not uh, how it, they did it because it's not practical. If you want to show hair, so, okay, it's really a beautiful picture and. Uh, uh, your hair may be uh, really good to see, but uh, if you're in the field and if you have uh, people to attend to, uh, the veil will just um, flow out in an instant. So it's really uh, just over the, the eyebrows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. And then I have uh, the skirt, white skirt, uh, classic, really round. Uh, for this one, it, I used like a very historical technique. Uh, uh, I had an old crinoline uh, petticoat that I did not longer use, so I just cut it uh, a bit on the on the sides uh, to 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 um, liberate my ankles so I could move uh, freely. 
uh, and just did uh, an overhem and poof, you have a nurse, <laughs> a nurse skirt. So in times of war, you do with what you what have. What you can, yeah. So really, um, so I have this thing also, uh, un brassard. I don't know how you, you call it in English, but you, you put it on the um, arm like this. Uh, I don't know the name, yeah. No, but this thing. <laughs> and I, I just don't remember on which arm it is. Every time uh, we, we, uh, I, I heard it and every time I forget because I really don't know my right from my left. No, but, same. Uh, <laughs> um, so you could also wear, wear it uh, without the nurse uniform. It, it helps so recognize uh, everybody from the nursing uh nursing field even if you didn't have the time to to put on the uh, the whole outfit uh, and it was also for the soldiers because you have nurses but they doctors uh, were also soldiers and uh, in a lot of uh, doctors uh, outfits you also have like this thing attached to the costume mm. and the last thing is really heavy. the uh, the cape Oh wow! <laughs> so it, it is. Really heavy. It, yes, it is pure pure wool. Mm. It's really heavy. Uh, I had the chance to find a fabric that had uh, nearly the perfect shade, uh, which was really difficult because uh, when you are doing uh, military and war reenactment, the colors are really important, and if you 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 are just one shade away, it shows. And so I had a lot of chance uh, with this one. So it's a wool one because on the camping sites, you may be really cold at night, uh, but they also mm -hmm. had uh, more lightweight, uh, lightweighted ones. And they were uh, also made from um, impermeable, um, like uh, um, waterproof, waterproof. Uh, wa waterproof, um, waterproof uh, fabrics. Uh, one of my fellow uh, nurses from another association had one like that and it's uh, really fun to to touch and, and see how it looked like. So I think... Uh, Did you use a pattern for this one? or um, A pattern? Uh, I had a modern pattern uh, and I, I just used it as a, as a base and then uh, I modified things uh, a bit but it's really simple like it's mostly a, a, a large circle um, that you see at the um, at the color, so so nothing really complicated, and oof, just very heavy to to wear. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's all for the garments. Um, the shoes, because <laughs> shoes are important. So these are the shoes I use for uh, my nursing outfits. So black. Uh, you see, like the um, I forgot the, the name. <laughs> Heel. The heel, thank you. The heel is straight, so it's obviously not a historical shape, but it is enough for for what I have to do with them. Uh, very practical and there is no zipper. It's like just lacing in the front, so it can pass uh, for for historical uh, historical reenactments. Um, I think like if it's some details like that, like obviously nearly nobody is making like this curved heels uh, anymore so mm -hmm. if you don't have uh, the money to to find yeah. like these perfect curved heels um things like that could be just fine just avoid the only thing to avoid is zippers but um out outside that uh, as long as you have something to can keep, uh, which can pass as historical mm -hmm. uh, as long as you, you're not like that close to to the garment it's it's pretty okay i had them for like 10 euros so uh already not regretting anything but this year <laughs> uh this year i also had uh, the occasion to uh had to add another treasure to my collection i just received them uh, it was meant to arrive in uh, September, but I got them in advance. Oh, this. oh I saw these on your Instagram. Yes. yes. <laughs> so it's um, like uh, for, for a really long time for the historical shoes, 
um, outside of American Duchess, uh, mm -hmm. we didn't have anything, but American Duchess is <laughs> not European. So uh, I didn't feel like paying an expensive pair of shoes and paying it twice uh, because of the um, shipping fees. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, but uh, a a French uh, a French um, uh, entrepreneur uh, brand. So, it's her name. Uh, she uh, made some historical shoes. She tried. It's the first year she she does America um, historical shoes, and they they came out pretty well. They are in. Um, they made it in satin and in uh, leather. Uh, I choose those in leather because for the exterior it's better. Uh, it's just like wonderful. I didn't put them um, to to work and everything, but I, I'm so so glad to to bring them with me with this weekend. And it's one another treasure, and I'm uh, really glad uh, I had the opportunity to pay in four times because <laughs> those kind of things are not uh, are not cheap. Yeah, I <laughs> and, imagine. Um, the uh, extended payment is really uh, convenient for people like that are yeah. beginning in life and don't yeah. have like the coffers or uh, Mr. and Mrs. Vanderbilt, for example. <laughs> Do you so, know if she ships outside of France as well, so within Europe? Uh, I think she she might ship in Europe. I think uh, I will drop you the website if you mm -hmm. want. I, I didn't check for me, but uh, I I don't know why she wouldn't ship in the Schengen space. Yeah. So um, be great to check that out. Mm -hmm. uh, other accessories. So the umbrella. So this umbrella is really like a Chinese umbrella that everybody <laughs> has at um, at weddings. Because uh, I didn't find a Belle Epoque umbrella that was not uh, worth being like one of my kidneys. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I, I, I am not, um, I don't know uh, in the other countries, but in France, I know a lot of uh, other reenactors, most often older ones, uh, get really mad when somebody uh, is having one of these umbrellas around during an event. So I make sure. Uh, not to bring these umbrella to public events because I just don't want uh, old hags to scream at me because uh, this isn't historical, I know. Uh, mm -hmm. But as it is a weekend between me and my friends, I am going to use it because I like historical things, but I like uh, better being protected from the sun. So uh, this will do just uh, the trick. And maybe someday I will find a... Ooh, uh, maybe I will find a, an umbrella. It is on my uh, list of things to, to buy, but uh, today... it's a long list, I imagine, <laughs> for every one of us. <laughs> um, the hats. So uh, basic straw hats. Um, the the um, garniture is really uh, just, oh, you yeah. can just put it away oh. like that uh, because um, having a lot of hats takes a lot of place. So I'd rather have one or two uh, bases and then uh, put the decorations um, depending on what I, what am I wearing. Uh, I have one big hat uh, with a lot of decoration. It took a lot of time for me to do it. So this one, I am not putting apart every time I have a, an event. Uh, but this one is really convenient. And as it is uh, black and white, it goes with a lot of outfits. So uh, it's really it's cute. Uh, efficient for Belle Park uh, and uh, 1890s. So I like I like this one. Obviously, the hairpins. Mm -hmm. um, the this one I made oh so it is a trick uh, maybe uh, you you want to have if you don't have time or if you don't have money to have a real hairpin uh, I use uh, this one is a um, une aiguille a, a needle a needle it's a needle for mattress ah okay so I just uh, used some some paper to uh, soften it off. The, yeah. the edge and put a, a little pearl uh, on the on the top side so you have this uh, this effect of a hairpin um, and it's like you see this one is authentic 
so it's really like it, it's it looks quite well. pretty well yeah. Yeah. and so you have with this technique like you have a, an hairpin for like uh, less than four euros per hairpin so mm. when you're on a budget it's pretty efficient and so this one authentic and this one as well and really l longer <laughs> but uh, very very useful for larger hats yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, and the belt uh, so this belt is is not authentic at all. It's from the 80s as well, um, with like a, so it's uh, elastic, but it's so uh, the the fabric is so dark that you can't see it uh, once you you tucked in it. Uh, you, you can't see it. um, it's a stretching fabric. Mm. So it's a little butterfly. And oh. in the 1980, uh, uh, 1890s, you had a lot of um, um, jewels and accessories with uh, nature, uh, nature inspired uh, things. So it, it goes pretty well with this period. Um, it's, it's not, uh, obviously it's not the, the perfect, uh, uh, accessory but it, it does the job pretty well and if uh, the people in front of me are not like a perfect the, the professional uh, reenactor or a really experienced one they, they won't see the, the difference so uh, I used it anyway mm. um, a little fan because it's hot out there <laughs> So oh, this one is made with uh, dentelle uh, so lace uh, of the puy en velay in France uh, which was very famous uh, for the Hansun uh, lace. Uh, I don't think this one is made by hand because it is really modern, uh, but still uh, pretty, pretty cute. So for summer, it would have uh, been far more expensive it, if yeah. it were been by hand. Yes. Made by hand. Yes. And uh, to finish, I have to, this one is also modern, but it, it does uh, also the job pretty well. Ooh. Okay, so this I need to to take it back, but it's uh, the chatelaine. Ah, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, to attach uh, the the fan and uh, a skirt lifter. One I will find once I will find one that doesn't like cost an arm. Uh, because, uh, I don't know why, but skirt lifters on eBay like it's it's crazy. Mm -hmm. They are worth so much. Yeah, and and so so I am struggling to find one, but I think someday, someday I will, or maybe I find a way to make it by hand. I don't know. Uh, well, so that's pretty much everything I'm going to put on my suitcase for that weekend. <laughs> that's only quite, already quite much to put in your yes. suitcase. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, you know what? Why they had like such big suitcases mm. to holidays? I understand why. Do you have an accurate suitcase as well? No, no, <laughs> I, I can't. So so heavy, so 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 difficult yeah. to find, so heavy to lift, and um, it's Too not precious practical. and yeah. so precious. Like I, I wouldn't, even if I had one, I, I couldn't bring myself to yeah, use yeah. them on vacation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, precious. And are you going already in dress there, or just changing when you're? Um, I don't know. Uh, maybe I will put like uh, one of my old dresses, but more like uh, 1920s or 1930s. Uh, but as I am driving to to go there, I, I just want to be uh, perfectly comfortable um, and and not be uh, bothered by long long dresses as I'm driving. Yeah. So but I will changing once uh, I get back there. Okay. Well, that sounds so yeah. exciting. Yes. I really yeah. want to go now too. <laughs> oh, I call this so fun. I'm also going to bring like some watercolor and and some pencils like to to draw and uh, try to to reconnect with uh, like traditional drawing mm. <laughs> because it's been a long time since since uh, I did it. So it's a perfect time I think to 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 make this on vacation. Yeah. If you're not preoccupied with nursing people, <laughs> uh, they, they, they won't. Uh, uh, they won't be too much trouble nursing them because uh, they are too afraid of needles anyway. So they make sure they are not falling ill or having <laughs> troubles because otherwise, I am uh, showing the needles. Oh, I, I cannot show it to you because it belongs to the association. But they, but they, they found for me a, a, a historical stash, nurse stash, with everything oh. inside. So the band-aids and everything wow. like 
as, as in the field. So I am so happy that they found that for me. But uh, Alice belongs to the association. I do not have it at home, unfortunately. Yeah, it's quite precious as well, I imagine. Mm -hmm. to have this. Yeah. Do you have any tips maybe for people who would like to start doing reenactment? What to mm -hmm. look out for? Uh, the first thing I would say is to starting with uh, day wear uh, because uh, it's more practical. Uh, you can also find like old blouses and old chemises that can, can do the trick. And the, the skirts are not the most difficult part to, to make as long as you keep them simple. Mm -hmm. I also would say to, to pick Belle Epoque. Uh, really like um, beginning of the 20th century it's the most simple simple to to begin with uh, and you have a lot of patterns um, not that expensive to to begin with uh, so yes uh, much more belle époque and they wear i would also say like um to to keep it simple um, not be not being afraid to use very simple cottons linens uh, simple rule and um, it's no 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 problem if there is not a lot of frills a lot of um a lot of decorations uh because uh not every household had the means to to have that much decoration on the dress and uh doing uh, middle class or lower class reenactment is uh as worthy to to be done uh, than uh, higher class reenactment, and so if you're sorting, uh, I, I think like middle class Edwardian they were is perfect to to begin with. Um, mostly like I would say to be to be very precise, uh, 1905 06. Uh, because the dresses became more simple and he, it's also the end of the bishop sleeves era so you don't have to bother with the bishop sleeves that are very too much specific <laughs> and too difficult to do uh, yes um, and also um, like pay pay attention it's not like I, I said it a lot of times that if everything isn't historically accurate it's not dramatic but uh, to pay attention um, to the hairdressing the hats to the small accessories. Um, again, it's not uh, it's not uh, dramatic if it's not perfect. But the hairdressing is something that is uh, really underlooked. Uh, but a good hairdressing, even if uh, your dress is not historically perfect, uh, will make all the difference. So yeah, focus on hairdressing and on the. Um, the way you do makeup. Um, I, I know some people in the historical costuming community that really are on the no makeup team, uh, but um, when pictures are taken, uh, it's not the same techniques and the, um, the, the defaults on the skin are showing a lot of uh, a lot of more. And also we forget that they also had makeup and they also had um, picture retouching back then. So uh, as long as you're not doing like the 2010 smoky eyes <laughs> on, yeah. your, on your Edwardian day dress, uh, it's fine to wear a little makeup if you're not comfortable with uh, the flows on your skin or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, do not do not listen to the old hags. Uh, there will always be old, old hags that, uh, and you will never be perfect to them, but mm -hmm. don't, don't bother. Don't bother. It's really not worth it. It's mm -hmm. not worth it. So don't bother and just try to improve yourself on your own path. And do not look too much at the um, over-the-top costumer that are doing it for like uh, 10 and more years. Uh, I know the Ka Ka Karolina Zebrowska work is stunning. It's the same way before the automobile. But uh, if you look, if you are looking only at those uh, over-the-top costumers, like, at one point you're going to, to be depressed because it's really nearly impossible to do uh, mm. as much as they do. And it's okay not to do mm. as perfectly as they, they are doing. Uh, it's fine and just uh, it's better to focus on your own improvements than to compare with um, the improvements of someone else. Mm. Yeah. But once again, uh, pretty easy to say, really less easy mm. to follow. I've been there myself. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much uh, everything I have to say. I think. Uh, oh, and also, uh, um, so uh, because I have them at the moment. If you have to wear glasses uh, at re reenactment and they are not perfectly accurate and you can't see without, just wear your glasses. 
<laughs> Once again, safety is uh, safety and well-being is uh, the number one priority. Um, I don't have like that much uh, trouble to see without my glasses. I put them because I am in front of a screen and otherwise I would get a huge migraine. So I can uh, put them away for the reenactment events, but nobody, uh, not everybody can do that. So if you don't have the perfect uh, period looking glasses and you need to wear glasses and you mm -hmm. can't um, support like the lenses, just wear glasses. <laughs> no, <laughs> if somebody tells you something, uh, they're a nurse. That's all. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. true. I'm someone I always have to wear glasses. So I thought about buying some which look peri periodically accurate, but they are so expensive. Mm. So, yeah. so maybe just when pictures are taken, uh, if mm -hmm. you, you are not moving, just <laughs> you, yeah. you put them. And then yeah. uh, when you're walking, just put the glasses and don't put yourself in danger. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, but uh, yes, period actual glasses are really, really expensive. My my boyfriend cannot uh, cannot uh, be separated from his glasses, so I am I, I looked for period glasses online, and and just the prices were so mm -hmm. high. I was like, okay. So and he will just remove them for the pictures and then he will keep them and nobody will, will be harmed and everything will be okay. <laughs> so, so yes. It's crazy that some people are taking this personally if nothing is really 100% accurate. I, I, like everyone, everyone's doing it for the fun, so why bother? I, I don't no. know. Uh, I don't know. Yes, I, 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 I see sometimes why they are like that because uh, at some events, um, we also have to recognize that sometimes like, people are not making the effort to, to document a little bit or to do things a little bit accurate and uh, with a little bit of accuracy and it shows and sometimes we see uh, costumes that are ugly and but if it's not from your association and it's not your personal event uh, if you see an ugly costume then it's just an ugly costume just turn, turn the eyes and, and it's okay. And if it's somebody yeah. from your association or from, from your group of friends that, it, that is doing it bad uh, with, uh, uh, ju just be, um, be gentle and explain mm -hmm. them uh, with patience and help them improve instead of being so mean. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I think there is also a lot of gatekeeping due from... Uh, it's uh, much from the older persons, but uh, pe I think they get mad at people who fell into the reenactment because of uh, popular uh, uh, popular shows, or things like that. Like mm -hmm. I, I seen it when when Bridgerton came out, came out yeah. two years ago. A lot of people fell in love with the um, Empire silhouette and everything. So of course, we they, they, there was a lot of uh, inaccuracies, but it was on the internet. And as long as people were doing it for the fun, why bother? Uh, but yes, I think it's a lot of um, uh, despise for, for the uh, the way we, we enter uh, inside. Like if, if you're not, uh, really documented on the history, and you just like I, I I seen this show, and I think the fashion is pretty cool. Uh, they they turn a bad eye on you, and I, I think it's it's not a good way to invite people in, in the reenactment, which is already uh, seen by a lot of people as a um, a a loisir, a um, like a business, a, a business. For, for really poshy people. So if we don't want to uh, continue to be looked over as poshy people, just be gentle. I, I don't yeah. know. But yeah, uh, but it's mostly the, the elder. Uh, I think it's mostly the elder. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when, when they are not that old, uh, it's just like they're, they're asses and just don't hang with them. <laughs> That's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any questions still? No, I'm just really inspired. Now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad I can inspire you. Do you have maybe like a dream persona that you'd like to reenact one day? A dream? Or a dream costume maybe? Um, or just a person I you'd have like to two, represent? two personas, I think. One is from the um, Second Empire. Uh, and it's pretty cool. I, I didn't knew... Um, 
her at the beginning and it was my grandmother uh, who looked at one of my pictures on Second Empire and she said, oh, you look just like her. You have like the, the same face. And it's like uh, the Castiglione. Uh, she was the mistress of uh, Napoleon III and she was known for being uh, the most extra uh, girl at the court. She has uh, wonderful outfits uh, that nobody else had the courage to pull. Uh, but they, they are really complicated to reproduce. So maybe one day one of the dresses of the Castiglione. And um, I think another uh, another girl I, I want to impersonate one day is uh, Elisabeth Vigée-Lebrun, mm -hmm. uh, which was the painter yes. of uh, Marie Antoinette, uh, because she, she, she paints uh, as I do myself. And I, I don't have like that much the time to wear uh, 18th century costumes, mm -hmm. but I, I love them so much. So uh, yes, maybe uh, Elisabeth mm -hmm. Vigero as well. You could go to the Fête Galante maybe one day. So expensive. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. Uh, I wore uh, the, la the first and last time I wore uh, 18th, 18th century was in the Venice Carnival. I went mm -hmm. one time with uh, a friend of mine and it was a wonderful experience, uh, but yes, so expensive as well. So maybe I, I'm just going to be uh, like, uh, I'm just going to wear uh, 18th century with friends and hang out in a, in in a park. <laughs> or another, like... <laughs> another castle. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But I find that, that there are a lot of historical events, even at other places like Fontainebleau, mm. maybe at other castles as well. So that's also a thing that doesn't, exist that much in Germany, not oh. sadly. Maybe more, yeah. in, I don't know, maybe more in Austria because of, you know, uh, yeah. CC and everything. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I don't see why there is not a, maybe, maybe there is more like folk groups, uh, mm. more the folklore part. Mm. That's strange because uh, there is a lot of things to do with um, German history as well. So. Yeah. We'll have to start there to do that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. I, start, I, I seen it with uh, Le Ballet when we were starting, just like having, hanging out with friends mm -hmm. and doing some, some stuff in historical costumes in the mm -hmm. city. Sometimes it just, it's just enough to spark the interest on people and you can just like um, bump into each other and the person is like, oh, I love what you do. And do you have an association or something? And it mm. grows bigger and bigger like that. And as long as it's good people with good vibes, uh, everything is all right, yeah. I think. That's true. Yeah. Mm. So mm. cool. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Maybe one day. <laughs> yeah. I am pressing the fingers for you. Uh, I'll let Thank you know you. if I'm going to Germany. <laughs> the, the closest I went uh, was uh, Alsace uh, oh, last, yeah. uh, last week, but mm -hmm. uh, maybe I will uh, cross the Rhine again. <laughs> and I will just uh, say hello. You are yeah. very welcome to come here to Aix-la-Chapelle yeah. if mm. you want one day. <laughs> I went one day and I was very little, but uh, I had the, I think it was a, a very beautiful city. Uh, that's how I remember it. It was it, it was beautiful, but I was very little, so maybe I confused yeah. with another another city. But yes, it's been more than ten years <laughs> that I've been to Aix la Chapelle. I mean, uh, you have been actually to Aix la Chapelle. It's, it's I have been actually, but I was ah, okay. very little. Mm -hmm. I, I had like eight years or less, so okay. uh, uh, it's really. The only thing I remember is eating a pretzel. <laughs> In Aix la Chapelle, okay. <laughs> The only thing you remember is eating. <laughs> <laughs> the most important part. <laughs> yes. Yes. So now I am figuring out how to uh, clean my mess. <laughs> you know, see, but like my room is a mess. I have everything mm -hmm. uh, everywhere and I need to put everything in my suitcase. So. Thinking of every piece without forgetting one is also quite difficult, I imagine. No, I, I yeah. always bring uh, a list because I'm not That's like I, I am one of the most forgetful uh, women in the area. So always, I'm always doing lists when I'm going to to an historical event because mm. one one time I forgot uh, it was a second empire reenactment in the Chateau de Versailles and we were paid to do this. Mm. And when we arrived at the gates of the castle, I was like, I forgot my crinoline. 
Oh no! Oh. I forgot the cage! I had the dress but didn't have the cage and I was like so lucky that somebody had the spare cage to, to let wow. me. So since that day I'm always making a list. Yeah. You bring two cages as well <laughs> to really make sure to have one. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, wow. And um, another question maybe for those who are interested in joining these kinds of events. Is it, how easy is it to join as a beginner, for example, when you're in Paris and want to join your association? Um, it depends. It depends on the association. Uh, for me, it was pretty easy because the first association I... Uh, I got to I got into uh, it, it, it's the biggest in Paris and they always need newcomers and things like that but it is the biggest one but it's not really not the healthiest one uh, so that's also why I left it and for obvious reason I am not going to drop names uh, there but so it was really easy to got in and when I got out uh, another member of the association founded uh, Le Ballet Imperial. So he, okay. he just told me to to join, and I joined. So it's it was easy for me. But at the moment in Paris, uh, we at Le Ballet Imperial are not taking any more newcomers because uh, the um, but only for the dance. But because the the dancing room we have for the courses is really small uh, because everything in Paris is really expensive and mm -hmm. there is not that much dancing rooms in France, uh, in Paris, sorry. Uh, so because of the size of the room and the, um, the, the we only have also one, one session per week, we, we cannot accept newcomers because we don't have the space to, yeah. to, to welcome them. So to join my association is pretty difficult at the moment, uh, at least if you want the dancing part, uh, but there is a lot of associations uh, in Paris and in the Région Parisienne and in France in general. So uh, there is always a way to, to join. And even if you're not joining a proper association, uh, there is so much historical event. Uh, you can just go and have fun in an event without being a member of an association. Maybe that's the moment when you make connection and you can uh, join a group. And so it really depends. I know that when, when I last, uh, I was with the, the, the last multi-historical uh, event I, I did with um, my World War One association, uh, I just uh, wandered around and made some drawings of the other campers and the other associations. And one association, which was, it was First Empire, something like that, a uh, popular First Empire reenactment. They just saw me and they invited me to a camp and gave me a drink and told me, hey, it, it would be cool if you came with us one day. Yeah. So, so something is as chill as that. So mm. it, it really depends. Uh, but uh, I would say if you, you begin, it's better to begin with a group of friends. Yeah. So you're not, you're not lost mm. and uh, it's more comfortable to make connection if you mm. have already people you're comfortable mm. with. And also if something goes bad in the association because sometimes it happens you're not alone if you're with friends mm. so yeah. yes with friends and small, small association but it depends and mm. it depends on the period um in france i think it's more uh, it's not that much we don't have that much uh belle époque it's more second empire we have a mm. lot a lot of first empire we, we have like yeah so much of that I, I wouldn't know how to do the, all this first empire but if you love to do first empire and you want an association come to france <laughs> there's interactions everywhere so yeah. Oh, yeah i haven't made anything from the first empire before so that will be a first for me yeah. <laughs> as i said not not my not my yeah. favorite team but it it's not that me. flattering also I, I mean it i think it would be difficult to look flattering Mm -hmm. no. Yes, and also that the main trap with First Empire fashion is that um, we have like this uh, stereotypical silhouette, 
Uh, but in fact, there is so much small variations that are making all the difference, like how many pleats you put at the back. If you do a round collar or if you do a cross uh, crossed one, uh, and all the, if you very 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 high waist or just just at the the ribs. So all these small details are making all the difference. And on some somebody, it will look very stunning and on another body it will be like awful so i think it is the most difficult with this era like the amount of sm the smallest details and they, they make all the difference and it's the era uh, where it does that uh, the most i think but fortunately it's not the most complicated one to sew as well it requires i think to, to be comfortable uh, with the first empire, it requires w one or two years experiences in the reenactment and swing, swing stuff. Uh, mm. but, so not that much. For yeah. the bustle era, however, <laughs> I would say more like four to five years because it's really so complicated to sew. I, mm. I, I just, I love that dress very much, but I, the end of the project, I was just cursing um, yeah. the amount of flowers, the amount of pleading I had to do with it. So, yes, if you're Takes beginner, a lot of time. do not start with the BSL mm -hmm. era. <laughs> yeah, I feel like with reenacting, you have so much to prepare also. If you really want to have a person you represent, you need all the outfits and mm. that just for one era and still have to pay attention to all the details. So. Yes, you spend a lot but, of time for it. Mm, yes, it's yeah. really time consuming. But as I am doing a lot uh, of my work on the computer, and I also uh, I also play a lot of video games, so on on the computer again. So it's really um, uh, helpful to me, like to to draw back yeah, to the yeah. screen. So I, I like that very, very much. And also, yes, something that I didn't mention, um, when somebody is presenting uh, her, his or her collection, and also this is only a small part, like if I open, there is also that much I think I didn't present. Yeah. But it's impressive, but uh, people have to keep in mind uh, that I, 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 do is, I do it for, five years, five, six years. Mm -hmm. So everything I have now is the result of five to six years to, of sewing, mm -hmm. of um, uh, searching in, into um, uh, thrift stores and, and yeah. event after event, you gather small pieces and event after event, your collection grows larger. But I, I didn't do this in one day, it was impossible. Yeah. So. If you're a beginner, do not panic if you only have a skirt and uh, a shirt. That's perfectly yeah. normal. Um, but yes, something I didn't say for the beginner, uh, don't forget the underpinnings. That's the most important yeah. part. Don't forget. Yeah. <laughs> don't forget the petticoats, please. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, yeah. But yeah, like, it, 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 it looks impressive, but um, it's six years of reenactment that there is in this uh, mm. rather small, actually, um, furniture, piece of furniture. <laughs> but I, I have some friends that, that did reenactment for the same time as me that have twice mm. the things I have and some other that have um, half the things I have. So it depends on if you I, I do a lot of different eras. So mm. obviously it makes the collection uh, larger, but I have some people, some some friends that are only doing Belle Epoque or only doing Second Empire, so it narrows uh, the yeah. collection as well. Yeah, that's true. Don't panic uh, because <laughs> of the size of, yeah. <laughs> of the reenactors' collections. Mm. It's not a. Uh, it's years of work combined. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So thank yes. you very much for your insight. It was really interesting and really inspiring for us. Thank you. And thank for you all the viewers too. Thank you. Yeah. So, what's your next reenactment plan after the one that you're making? Um, so I have. Uh, it's in the beginning of September. I have the Fat Historic Dotin. Uh, it's a multi-period uh, reenactment. 
uh, it's not that far um, to my home, so I'm pretty happy to be there. It will be a World War I uh, as well, so I'm going to put my favorite nurse outfits because it's very convenient. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and after that, um, middle of September, we have another Belle Epoque, um, Belle Epoque event in Dunkerque, so in the yeah. far north of France, mm -hmm. uh, on a boat um, that sailed in the 1900s, something like that. Um, so yeah, that the main events for, uh, for September, and we have a lot more in Fontainebleau. Uh, in Fontainebleau in October, November, we have a big uh, Second Empire reenactment in Fontainebleau, and I am going to give a small lecture on um, women clothing during the Second Empire. So, and my association is, is paid for all of that. So, a lot of stress, yeah. <laughs> a lot of stress, obviously, but I am very looking forward to it. A lot of fun, also. It's mm. Yeah. Yes, that sounds no, that's, really cool. That's it with historical events, a lot of stress before, a lot of fun uh, after. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining us, and we have now talked for over an hour, so <laughs> this will be a long podcast episode. But yeah. So we wish you all the best, and maybe we'll stay in contact. Yeah. Yes, and you too. All the best, and yeah. thank you for your time. Thank you for reaching reaching out to me. Like it gave me so much self confidence. That I didn't knew yeah. I could interest someone. So <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you a lot. Yes. Yeah, so we'll say goodbye. Bye bye. bye. <laughs> See you soon. See you soon.